All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, very warm welcome to the uh, second of our departmental um, uh, events in celebration of our 50th anniversary in the Department of Geography, Planning and Sustainability, which was last year. But of course, circumstances dictated that we delay this. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Kelsey Leonard, who will be giving a talk and uh, be introduced by Dr. York in just a moment. But I wanted to take this moment to um, acknowledge our support and to say a couple of words about the department in general. Um, this event is uh, being supported by the Department of Geography, Planning and Sustainability of Rowan University with support of the Dean's Office of the School of Earth and Environment and the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, including the uh, Social Justice uh, Inclusion and Conflict Resolution uh, uh, Program. So thank you very much to all of those uh, streams that together brought Dr. Leonard here today. Um, this is the uh, talk in our series that is uh, given the focus of the attention of the program in uh, GI uh, GIS, Geographic Information Science, and its related methods of geographic information systems, for which we have a pretty broad and diverse program uh, with a bachelor's of science and certificates of undergraduate studies and a post-baccalaureate certificate. The department also has programs in uh, community and environmental planning and um, environmental and sustainability studies, as well as geography, and a number of other pathways toward uh, graduate education, both with our Master's of Science in Community and Regional Planning, as well as um, the uh, 4 plus 1 program into um, the uh, MBA program in, in uh, conjunction with the business school. So uh, thank you. I think that is all of the things that I was supposed to introduce. And I turn the floor back to uh, Dr. York, who will um, offer a statement and introduce Dr. Leonard. Thank you. to talk to this little camera. All right, hello, I'm Dr. Ashley York. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Geography, Planning and Sustainability. Process. Um, in conjunction with Dr. Leonard's talk, we would first like to offer a native land acknowledgement. The land upon which we gather is part of the traditional territory of the Lanai Lenape called Lenape Hoking. The Lenape people lived in harmony with one another upon this territory for thousands of years. During the colonial era and early federal period, many were removed west and north, but some also remain among the continuing historical tribal communities of the region. The Nanticoke Lanai Lenape Tribal Nation, the Ramapo, Lenape Nation and the Powhatan Renape Nation, the Nanticoke of Millsboro, Delaware, and Len Lenape of Ches Cheswold, Delaware. We acknowledge Len Lenai Lenape as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with their territory. In our acknowledgement of the continued presence of the Lenape people in their homeland, we affirm the aspiration of the great Lenape chief Tamanand let there be harmony between the indigenous people of the land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land, as long as the rivers and creeks flow and the sun, moon, and stars shine. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kelsey Leonard. She is a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Waters, Climate, and Sustainability, and an assistant professor in the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo, where her research focuses on Indigenous water justice and its climatic, territorial, and governance underpinnings. Dr. Leonard seeks to establish Indigenous traditions of water conservation as the foundation for international water policymaking. Dr. Leonard has been instrumental in safeguarding the interests of Indigenous nations for environmental planning and builds Indigenous science and knowledge into new solutions for water gover governance and sustainable oceans. In collaboration with a global team of water law scholars, Dr. Leonard has published in Lewis and Clark Law Review on Indigenous Water Justice and the Defining International Legal Principle of Self-Determination and the, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Her recent scholarship explores legal personhood for water, and you can watch her TED Talk, Why Lakes and Rivers Should Have the Same Rights as Humans, which has over 3 million views. I personally saw Dr. Leonard give a talk in a series by ESRI, which is the mapping software our 
or GIS programs use. Um, and it was called Women in GIS Mapping Their Stories. Uh, today, Dr. Leonard will be speaking about putting indigenous place names and languages back on maps. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Kelsey Leonard. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. York, for that invitation, uh, introduction, and to the larger uh, committee, planning committee, and to Rowan University for the invitation to be here to speak with you all today. Um, I believe I may need sharing privileges, and I will get my slides loaded. There we go. Just make sure I can see everyone and the wonderful chat function, because we are going to have an interactive conversation today, as much as we can in these virtual times. So uh, a quay, hello everyone. As uh, Dr. York mentioned, I'm Dr. Kelsey Leonard. Um, our talk today is about putting indigenous place names and languages back on maps, uh, the language portion being very, uh, very critical as well. And if you would like to tweet along for today's conversation, my Twitter handle is at Kelsey T. Leonard. You're also welcome to follow up with me in that space after today if you have further questions. So to start off our conversation, I want to get to know a little bit from you about what knowledge you may already have of Indigenous peoples. Um, and Dr. York gave you a little bit of a leg up on this question. So how many tribal nations are there in the United States? Um, for those that are attending virtually, you can type your guesses into the chat box. And those that are attending in person, uh, you might be able to, to shout them out to uh, Dr. Keenan. And I believe uh, another uh, classroom can maybe chat, type them into the chat box for you. We've got some numbers coming in and I will call them out. We've got seven. Anyone wanna go higher or lower? This can be like the price is right, so. 116, let's get a few more going. 586, 20, 300 from class. Thank you, Dr. Keenan. 22, okay, about 10 more seconds to get any additional guesses in. Approximately 550. I feel like at this stage too, I have to be preemptive to make sure no one's going to Google to, to get the answer. 570, thank you. Wonderful. Well, these are really great guesstimates, uh, but you also should know that they're really varied as well. So each of you is coming from a different positionality of understanding in connection to Indigenous nations in the United States, which for most of us today, um, we call home. So this is a map that was generated in 2000 uh, by the U.S. Census Bureau. It's, it's a little bit dated, but we're in, we're in a mapping conversation today. Um, and so I, I share that with you so you can kind of see some of the uh, territories. Uh, getting to know Indigenous territories on maps is very, very difficult. At least it has been historically. Um, I share this map from the 2000 Census often, too, because Growing up, it was the first interaction I had with a map that actually showed my nation, our territory, and our community. Um, otherwise, before this 2000 US Census Bureau map, I felt like we were completely erased, or I had to go to historic maps to actually feel like I was represented. Um, and so I share that because it's a bit of my connection to the history that I'm going to share with you today and to how I came to be involved with GIS ecosystems, as I like to call them, um, and also how you may come to know this diverse knowledge of Indigenous experience. And so in um, the United States today, in regards to Indigenous demographics um, and what we call Native American statistics as well, we have about 9.7 million people that reported as American Indian or Alaskan Native in the 2020 census. And we've got of that population, about 29% of American Indians and Alaskan Natives are under the age of 18. So we also have a really, really young population, a population that is growing, impressionable, um, curious, wanting to see their future represented in the various forms of media and scientific communication that are out in the world today. And so when we think about what are the impact of maps of geospatial information, they have a, 
a very resonating and reverberating impact on young people. As I shared with my own experience of not seeing a map before the 2000 census that fully represented my community or my connection to the broader indigenous communities across the United States, sometimes what we call Indian country. Um, and when we think about the initial answer of how many tribal nations are there in the United States, well, there are 574 federally recognized tribes. So kudos, I think, to, uh, to a few of the classrooms that, that got a number in the 500s and a few others that got even closer. Um, but, and when we say federally recognized, 574 federally recognized tribes means that there are 574 individual nations that are in a government to government relationship with the United States of America. Outside of that 574 federally recognized tribes, there are numerous more, hundreds more, state recognized tribes across the United States, and then additional unrecognized indigenous communities that don't, that aren't in a government to government relationship with the state that they uh, may neighbor or the federal government, um, but that still con are connected and represent a formed indigenous community, and then also large urban indigenous populations. You are, are located uh, in close proximity to some of the major cities mega cities of the world like New York and Boston and Washington DC, Los Angeles as well. These are all representative of large urban indigenous populations, some of the largest urban indigenous populations in, uh, the, um, in the world, in fact. And uh, I just got a little bit of a notica notification. I just want to make sure that the screen is still showing. Someone will, you can always flag me if it, if it stops uh, showing clearly. But with that, I want to now transition to a conversation about land acknowledgement. Dr. York started us off with a great acknowledgement of the uh, territory that the university now occupies and the sustained indigenous communities that have stewarded that land for millennia and continue to exist in that part of the world, uh, maintaining their cultures and traditions and governance systems and likely should be reflected on our mapping systems, but often aren't. Um, and so I love to share this new digital portal. I, I feel like even in my lifetime, we've seen so many advancements in uh, geospatial information systems and that allow, and mapping, that allow for indigenous visibility to be more present and prescient across our society. Um, and one example of that is nativeland.ca. Um, don't forget the hyphen, otherwise it may take you to a different website. Um, but nativeland.ca is a living portal uh, that is constantly updating information on uh, historic indigenous territories, languages, as well as treaties. Um, the treaty layer is still being uh, sort of developed and, and in progress. I would say it probably has the um, most area for development in terms of content, uh, but that is in large part because they are working to digitize uh, primary source material, archive material of those original treaties and then uploading them into the data framework. So I, um, I highlight this as another way of today, if in Dr. York reading out the land acknowledgement, you may have you know, maybe that was the first time you heard of land acknowledgement. Maybe that was the first time you heard of the uh, Lenape people and the Lenape Hoking and the land that you're on and how they have stewarded that, that space and that place that you now call home or that you now learn and, and live in. And so this is another great tool for you to be able to go and, and build on that foundation and build your knowledge and learn more about the communities. Um, and you're at university, so maybe this part of the world isn't where uh, you grew up or where you have the most affinity. Um, and so this data portal is actually a global portal, again, still living and, and more information being added every day, um, but it should give you at least uh, the direction uh, of, of how to find the indigenous peoples that are um, in the place that you now live or work or play. And so I wanna bring you back now to where I come from. Um, I'm. Uh, I guess maybe you'd say a stone's throw away from, from Rowan University, uh, my home community, being an enrolled citizen of the Shinnecock Nation. We're located on the east end of Long Island in New York. Um, we also, traditionally, the east end of Long Island would um, be all of our ancestral territory, but due to colonization um, and uh, land usurpation or the stealing of land 
our existing territory has been diminished to what you see in purple here, um, which is um, what we call the Shinnecock Neck, a peninsula surrounded on three sides by water and a barrier island and the Atlantic Ocean uh, on the other side. And so when we think about maps and mapping and the portrayal of, of removal and uh, colonization, they also are, are very important to the stories that we tell, to the way in which we understand history. And we can't really know where we're going unless we know where we've been. Um, and I think that that is one of the greatest opportunities we have as uh, scientists, as those who are working to advance GIS ecosystems, is to be able to tell stories and to tell stories of those who have been historically and maybe even contemporarily continue to be oppressed, marginalized. There is so much in the realm of social justice work, uh, climate justice work, environmental justice work that we can do. And I already am seeing it um, being done to, to advance that work in the space of visual representation of place and space and geography. And you all are undergraduate students, so I think sometimes when you have an academic uh, a professor come in to speak, you, you may feel like, oh, I, how did they get to do what they're doing, or how did they get interested in this, or did they start off knowing that they were going to uh, be interested in GIS? Uh, I will say uh, I did not know that that was where my path was going to lead me, that I was going to have, um, some of these pictures are from 15, 20 years ago, I think that self uh, would not have known that I would have had uh, major partnerships with, with Esri and um, different GIS uh, communities and, and working with different technology platforms to advance uh, some of the issues that I mentioned earlier. And so I would say to you, if, if you, I think maybe by sitting in, in for this session and, for, and being a GIS student, you, you probably are already a step ahead of where I was uh, 15 years ago in knowing that this is something that you have a, a dear interest in. Um, but I also want to encourage those who maybe this is your first lecture that you're sitting in on, maybe you're a new student to GIS and you're wanting to um, feel like you belong. I, I think um, maybe I, my story will hopefully resonate with you to know that, that you do belong and that you can help to shape the discipline and to shape the types of mapping products that come out for future generations so that they can also feel that sense of belonging. So for my trajectory, I did my undergrad at Harvard University. I uh, majored in anthropology and sociology. So maybe ge geography tangential, but not, not within the discipline. I then did a master of science in water science policy and management. And I think that's probably where a bit of my spark for uh, GIS and for the spatial representations of indigenous uh, governance started. Um, I went to, I then went on to law school in, in Pittsburgh actually, and I was working in the field of uh, largely environmental law in a place where there are three major rivers and looking at um, a, a lot of my, my work in, in law school looked at um, indigenous removal due to the proliferation of hydropower or dams. Um, and a big, to understand that work was to also look at historic maps, to look at the way in which indigenous peoples were removed from territory and how that then contributed to the proliferation of hydropower and to um, uh, flooding uh, measures that were put in or anti-flood measures that were put in uh, by the federal government and the Army Corps of Engineers. And that really started me, I think, more, more broadly on my current trajectory of being a, a scientist that works in the space of water governance and transboundary water governance. And I, I went and did my uh, PhD PhD at McMaster University in political science. And some of the work that I will share with you today, as well as some of the work that I did in law school, um, is, is centered in, in, in the presentation and, and really kind of how I, I fell into uh, being a, a GIS person. So if at any point in time, you have felt like you just aren't sure if this is for you or that you don't necessarily belong, um, I'm here to give you a um, accolades and kudos to stick with it because having diverse perspectives and lived experiences to shape the future of our GIS ecosystems is what we really need to advance equity and justice uh, around the world and particularly across the United States. So let's see what your thoughts are on the existing state of mapping and geospatial information. 
Uh, you probably may have seen um, this question before, this, this sort of graphic before. Um, how do you view the world? This is the Robinson projection of the world. In looking at this projection, are there ideas, reflections, thoughts you have about how this projection, um, what might be some of the downsides as well as the benefits of this projection? You can um, type into the chat box or for those that are in a live classroom, if you want to raise a hand, I'm open to us unmuting and asking or sharing your thoughts live. We have a question in the classroom, Dr. Leonard. Okay. Were you able to hear that, Dr. Leonard? It did not come through, but I love this. So if you're able to just repeat what they said, then I will be happy to answer. Sure. One of the students uh, commented that it's the distortion of the map. That's something that stood out to the student. Is that accurate? Yes. yes. Thank you for sharing that reflection. Yeah, there is a distortion to the map, but I'd probe you to go even further. Um, and others can, can add on to, to this line of inquiry. How is the map distorted if you perceive it to be? We have another comment from the classroom. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, um, it's, uh, it's really good for travel. Um, when you like for people who travel on boats, and it's distorted in a way because one, some countries aren't that big, and some areas are not that small. Were you able to hear that, Dr. Leonard? Right, I got pieces of it, but if you have a summary, yeah. that would be lovely. Sure. One, the first part was that um, the map is good for people who are traveling by boat. Right. And then what was the second part? Oh, the distortion part. Some countries aren't that big. Some countries aren't that small. And then it's the distortion of the country size. Some are not portrayed in, in terms of their true size of the country. Really great points all around. And for those that are participating virtually, if you have additional thoughts that you want to share in the chat, feel free. Um, but yes, the, this is there are many, many other t forms of, of thoughts and reflections that you can share about the, the, the projection that's put forward. And this is sort of the Robinson projection is kind of the dominant projection that we often um, engage with. And there can be distortion of actual size. That distortion of size, unfortunately, being human beings or the way in which we have a past dependency of, of political understanding of power, we equate something being large with having greater power um, based within a Western and Westphalian worldview. So that distortion can have large political implications for a national entity. Uh, we also position certain national borders uh, as being more centered than others, depending on a map projection. Uh, we often see that there's more priority of projection placed on uh, North America and Europe than the global South. Why is that? Well, we have to ask who has the power, the control, the autonomy to make decisions about projections? Who has the autonomy to decide how technology and more broadly GIS ecosystems are able to spatially represent and project those uh, different forms and frameworks and projections to us as consumers? Um, and then later on, as you start to maybe go on and do your own research and our scientists looking to um, share stories again, right? To to voice that spatiality, communicate that spatiality through a visual representation. Uh, projections can imbue certain knowledges and certain values over others. And then another person mentioned, uh, yes, centered on Europe, exactly. And the focus on water makes sense if we consider that the map was created by people who viewed land as something to be conquered, arriving by water and colonized, uh, centered on the prime meridian of Greenwich. Yes, so really, really great points. And I wanna highlight the aspect around water because we're starting to see as we get more diversity within geography as a discipline, within uh, those within power to construct and manipulate and imagine new geospatial uh, layouts, we're starting to see new projections emerge. 
um, and old projections be more uh, be be more uh, often considered as the centering. And I would argue, in the work that I do from an indigenous uh, positionality, that why do we center, as someone mentioned, why do we center land over water? What if we centered the water in our conception of projections and of how we interact and recognizing that the ocean is not something that is a barrier or a boundary to our existence as societies and, and nation states, but rather a connector, that, it, that that ocean, the water, the one ocean connects all of us together. And so projections, map projections, the types of maps that we use to communicate messaging are important to our political ideologies, to our socioeconomic experiences, to our cultural experiences, and ultimately what we choose to put forward on a map conveys our values, conveys our morality as human beings, and what we choose to value over other things. And it also has implications, as I mentioned earlier, for questions around equity and justice, as well as the negative impacts of the non-realization of those ideals in terms of marginalization, oppression, colonialism. And so I wanna transition now to talking a little bit about how, again, as I mentioned, I sort of fell into this work. Um, this is a map of the mid-Atlantic states of the United States. I just sort of open source, you know, courtesy of Google, here's a map that you get when you when you do a keyword search for the mid-Atlantic uh, of the US. Rowan University being included in that. What do you notice about the map? And particularly, what do you notice is missing from the map? We can take uh, answers in the chat or if anyone in the classroom wants to give a guess, we'll have uh, Dr. Keenan share out. Major rivers, okay, yes. We don't see a lot of ecological actors within the map, good point. Any other things missing from the map? We have a comment from the classroom. Yes. I don't know what the zoom map here, but they're all pretty sounded like either initially European settlement or the descendants of European settlers, there's no indigenous, like, sort of like town, um, like, villages mentioned in there. Uh -huh. Very American, like Eurocentric map. So the, the comment from the class is that the cities that are depicted and places that are depicted are, are from European descent. They were founded by Europeans and not That's other. That's yep. Yeah, that's a really, really great um, reflection and 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 ID. Um, I'll also note too that some only some cities are highlighted, and someone in the chat wrote, "It seems like only cities that are hubs of capitalism are highlighted." I mean, some of you may be from different parts of Jersey, and all they noted was Atlantic City, and I feel like that might offend some folks that that's the only place that's mentioned. And that's because we are all coming from different lived experiences, different understandings of what spatial representations should include. Um, but I think as we try to, uh, you know, it's hard for, for, for in creating maps, right? It's hard because as you start to add more information, it can become very, it can feel very cluttered. So what do you pick? What do you prioritize? But what I hope you take away from our conversation today is that if all we prioritize are those places and names and languages of a certain background over others, then what are we conveying about our society? What are we saying to young people who may not be from those backgrounds, may not be from the cities pictured here about their value in the world? Because whether we like it or not, when you look at a map and you don't see yourself listed, you don't see yourself represented, you can feel very devalued um, or that your existence is erased or that your um, experiences are made invisible. And so that's kind of what my experience was going in as a legal and policy expert in ocean policy for the United States in the mid-Atlantic region 
and coming into contact with mapping interfaces, GIS interfaces, that really didn't mention Indigenous peoples at all. From that map that I showed you of the Mid-Atlantic, you'll note that Indigenous nations, unlike the U.S. Census Bureau map, that, although dated, that I showed you, um, they're just not listed. They're completely erased, and yet they are seen as the that not seen, they are um, the third sovereign in the tri-sovereign state of the United States of America. There's the federal government, there are the state governments, and there are tribal governments. And that is codified within our constitution and federal law. And yet, when we think about ocean policy and having all of those actors at the table, but not being represented on maps, it makes our ability to negotiate, to uh, mediate, to come into open conversation for decision-making more difficult because we don't have all the actors at the table that should be to make the best available decisions on uh, the best available science that we have. And so let's take a step back and I'll tell you a bit more of how I got into this work. So. I mentioned federal ocean policy. About 10 years or so ago, um, the US uh, national ocean policy was created. Uh, it was established by an executive order uh, uh, then under President Obama in July, on July 19th of 2010. And it was to coordinate and implement regional ocean planning with state, federal, tribal, and fishery management council representatives. Um, and it really was set out a purpose that we can work towards an America whose stewardship ensures that the ocean, our coast, and the Great Lakes are healthy and resilient, safe and productive and understood and treasured so as to promote the well-being, prosperity and security of present and future generations. And so it, it really was a catalyst for thinking about who are the ocean actors in the Mid-Atlantic? And we weren't alone in setting out on in this conversation and on this endeavor to try and develop federal policy around the conservation of the ocean. Um, these other regional planning areas, including the Northeast, the South Atlantic, the Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, Great Lakes, West Coast, Pacific Islands, and Alaska Arctic were also established. All of our regional planning bodies were to use the best available data to in, improve decision making. Um, stakeholders were proactively to be engaged in the decision making processes, and that it was that these regional planning bodies, these forms where all of these ocean actors were to come together, were to be a venue for federal agencies, states, tribes, and fishery management councils to work together to address ocean issues and inform decision making. And so, as I mentioned, when I came into my role as a uh, tribal co-lead for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Planning Body that was constituted under the National Ocean Policy, I was, we were creating a data portal. Um, it, it really already existed. I think the portal launched in 2008, so maybe about two years prior to the um, executive order issuance and through the regional ocean partnerships, were, which were a collaboration of states in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, and so we were, our charge as a regional planning body in using the best available science to inform decision making was to ensure that we were capturing that data and that science in a portal, open the uh, access portal that was accessible to all actors and stakeholders. And so when I came in and I looked at the portal and saw that indigenous nations were completely absent, tribes weren't even listed, I was like, well, how are you going to get these this third set of actors, tribal partners, to engage if you're if they're not even captured in this uh, in the GIS layers of the portal? And so that was it was kind of an out of sight, out of mind experience for my collaborators, where until they had an indigenous collaborator coming on and saying, an indigenous person in a leadership role coming on and saying, there's a big gap in the science and in the data, we need to fix it. Um, they didn't realize that 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 was missing. And I don't think it was out of you know malicious intent or um, not wanting to work with tribes. They just they just didn't know what they didn't know. Um, and so in sharing that insight, they we all came together as state, federal, and and sort of tribal partners and said, well, we're gonna fix this data gap. Um, we started dialogues, was sort of the first step. Um, with indigenous leaders in the region to discuss what types of data they thought should be present in this type of open GIS platform. 
Um, we talked to, in after those dialogues, we talked about adding traditional ecological knowledge, data layers. I think we were maybe a little bit um, ahead of our time as this week, the White House Office of Science, uh, Technology and Policy has just released a federal memorandum um, stating that they were going to develop federal guidance on how all federal agencies can engage in um, the, engage with indigenous uh, ecological, uh, traditional, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge in their work. Um, and 10 years ago, we were, we were already doing that and, and saying that it needed to be a priority as a regional planning body. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that that, that will uh, continue to inspire others and that that federal memorandum will actually lead us to seeing more data portals that advance indigenous knowledge across um, federal agencies and in federal data systems. Um, and from that, so we, we prioritize TEK, we talk to, to actual people on the ground, because that's the other thing about GIS. There's people involved, there's land involved, there's real uh, environment, and it can't just be something that exists in isolation on a computer, um, because you really should see that that computer, um, that technology as a tool through which to communicate the real lived stories of folks on the ground. Um, and that was a part of our work too, was to mobilize uh, the, these data layers, to mobilize this information, uh, to be put forward in our ocean action plan, which is a part of the, la the um, larger national ocean policy being developed. And so uh, the first step was actually documenting the tribes uh, in the region at the time. We actually worked with both state and federally recognized tribes uh, to uh, list their communities throughout um, the portal. And at the time, uh, this one's a, a little bit dated, but I share it because you can see how we were um, engaging with tribes. We worked with both state and federal, but now some of these tribes who were state recognized, uh, and I don't have much time to go into this in detail, but who were state recognized at the time that we uh, developed the portal um, in 2015, 16, uh, the data portal layers for tribes, I mean, 2015, 16, they were state recognized tribes going through a process of federal recognition to um, have their government to government relationship with the United States acknowledged, even though these tribes are historic tribes that have been in the region uh, prior to contact and have storied uh, relationships with the colonies and then states and, and now the federal government. So seven of the Virginia tribes are actually now federally recognized tribes. And so um, we were really, again, proud of the work that we did and acknowledging that these are our governments and, and communities that are doing wonderful work to advance ocean conservation and needed to have their voices um, at the table as well in decision-making. And in talking with tribal leaders throughout the region, they told us that the types of data they wanted to see on the portal, and not all of this is captured yet, um, but they wanted to see data about aquaculture and heritage sites, um, traditional, um, um, traditional items of deep cultural importance like wampum, uh, resources uh, that acknowledge the submerged cultural resources of tribes, our canoe journey routes, uh, things around our tribal fishing, our management areas, and really, um, I think a very prescient issue right now is the impact of climate change on our communities. Um, this is uh, some imagery of flooding after Superstorm Sandy on Long Island in 2012. Um, and so we also recognize that spatial information, again, cannot solely be captured in two dimensions. As Indigenous peoples, our knowledge is living. And so we wanted to be able to share stories, to actually have video recordings, audio recordings, have there be a multi-dimensional experience in data portals. Um, and so we developed um, what are called um, ocean stories. And they're not just uh, uh, highlighting the voices of indigenous peoples, they highlight the voices of ocean champions throughout the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and the portal that I'm highlighting, Marco Data Portal, includes uh, information that may be of uh, value to you as GIS students um, in New Jersey. And so please feel free to go and, and take a look. Um, you can, the portal is, as I mentioned, open access. You can go, you can maybe use it for a class. You can add it to a, a story a story map. There's a lot of fun things that you can do um, with the oceans, uh, with the portal. And then also just being able to watch some of the ocean stories. And so we had to, in terms of creating custom maps, like how do you actually, okay, you got a great idea. How do you put it into practice? 
Um, well, we had to um, import um, map data from external sources. So we had to actually go and source the data if it already existed. If it didn't, then that means that we have to find funding and resources to develop the data so that it can be captured in the future. Um, we identified and documented areas of interest uh, using um, drawing tools that were available in the platform. And um, we did that in partnership with uh, listening sessions I'll talk about in a moment with tribal leaders. And then we would export those drawings as GIS files and share them with map as custom maps with those that had um, indicated either a preference for, um, for public setting or for keeping them um, protected uh, due to certain um, security protocols that might be needed if the data uh, that was being mapped was of uh, cultural significance or something that shouldn't necessarily be shared with the broader public for fear of um, it being um, misused or misappropriated. And so this engagement process that I've mentioned, it included listening sessions where you actually have to go. And so again, if you're thinking about, oh, what does a career in GIS look like? Well, it mean, you, you're not just sitting behind a computer all day. Um, sometimes it means listening sessions, it means engaging the public, it means working with stakeholders to understand what types of information they value. Because again, what we've seen historically is maps generated by the perspectives and perceptions of a select few, when in reality, we can, we can democratize GIS. We can create it in such a way that it's informed by the public for the public. Um, and that's what listening sessions enable. We also, um, there's a new uh, methodology, not, I, I, say, I would say new in probably the past two decades, that does exactly what I just described previously about democratizing GIS, and it's called participatory GIS sessions, where you actually work with communities um, to collaboratively create new spatial data in live mapping sessions. And so that was another really interactive methodology that was um, very well received by tribal leaders in the region when we put it forward for them. Because previously, they, they were never asked. There really are very few existing maps that are for Indigenous peoples by Indigenous peoples. And a part of my career trajectory is trying to change that and create more opportunities for allied collaboration across Indigenous and non-Indigenous scientists. And so, some of the best practices that came out of this work were that you should um, definitely prioritize consultation, talking to people, um, that mapping data of, about Indigenous peoples should be, have the authorization of those Indigenous peoples to be made public, um, and that we need more training opportunities for young people to get interested in GIS, to get interested in mapping and in geospatial um, disciplines. And then more uh, additionally, we also noted that data sharing agreements are a really wonderful um, tool to protect indigenous data and protect indigenous peoples that historically may have faced different um, types of um, colonialism, oppression, extraction of their data without their consent, um, misuse of their data without their consent. So data sharing agreements are a really great tool to make sure that all parties involved in a collaborative scientific endeavor um, agree on how data should be collected and used and governed. And so I'm happy to say that, you know, about six years after we started collecting um, information, doing the hosting listening sessions, having PGIS sessions, talking with tribal leaders, we actually have, um, when we started in, I think in 2015, 2016, the, we only had one layer available on the portal and it was the tribal headquarters, uh, where, where are the tribes located? Um, but now through, again, sourcing data from different federal agencies and from uh, different um, open platforms like nativeland.ca, we now have um, six layers on the portal that you're able to uh, interact more with Indigenous peoples and Indigenous communities and really raise the consciousness of Indigenous visibility in mid-Atlantic ocean planning. Um, so we include uh, the uh, territorial areas and census tracts uh, for um, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian populations in the Mid-Atlantic. There's a tribal leaders directory, so you can click on the headquarters and get contact information for tribal leadership, especially, which is especially important if you're trying to do ocean decision making and you don't know who to contact. Um, that was a big, big concern along, along the way of doing this work. 
um, native languages are there, our terrestrial territory boundaries, um, as well as uh, the Environmental Protection Agency also works with tribes across regions to advance environmental protections. And so those headquarters are listed. So that was how I sort of was thrown into GIS. And then, and that was um, really quite soon after completing my undergrad and uh, through my master's and law school. And then when I came to do my PhD, I had a real um, recognition and breadth of experience in understanding the uh, erasure of indigenous peoples from mapping interfaces. And so my research in, in my PhD was focused on the Great Lakes where, where I now live in the University of Waterloo is. Um, and again, you can kind of see, um, you, can, you can go to, there's a wonderful um, uh, data platform uh, created by David Rumsey. Um, it's a davidrumsey.georeferencer.com. Um, and it's actually sort of a, a library of historic maps, but what they do is they take um, the base layer is a contemporary map um from i think they yeah they're using open street map as their as their data layer backgrounds um and so you, again you can see that indigenous peoples have kind of been erased from the background of the map but if you pull one of the historic maps for this uh, great lakes region this is lake ontario and lake erie and that's the city of buffalo and uh hamilton and toronto um if you pull a historic map you can actually overlay a historic map on where it would have been um, or where it is in the context of the contemporary map. And you can see here that one of these historic maps from uh, the colonial period, indigenous peoples were, were all over the map. We have the village of the Hurons, the village of the Wendats, the um, Tuscaroras, we, you know, the, um, I think Abenaki's on here too, um, Lenape's are on here. So we were we were listed, we were seen and and visible, and because we were you know very much interacted with um, uh, throughout the colonial period, um, it was important to have us listed on on maps because people needed to know where they were visiting and who um, and whose territories they they were coming into into contact with. Um, but unfortunately, that changed, and you know, a part of my PhD work was to actually. Um, place or, 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 or create a new map that could show uh, the indigenous nations across uh, the Great Lakes Basin, because oftentimes um, in this binational context of the US and Canada, we, uh, I could find a map that maybe had all of the tribal nations on the US side, and I could find a map that had all of the First Nations on the Canadian side, but I couldn't find a map that was just of the Great Lakes Basin with all of the indigenous nations identified so we could have some type of facial representation of the diversity of actors in the basin. Um, and that is very common. You know, we like to imagine these borders and the lakes, they're just, they're just there. They're just existing. They're like, you know, it's nice to see you again. I don't know why you're putting this imagined border over me. Um, and it makes it very difficult oftentimes when you go into spaces and forums where you're trying to make transboundary decisions across two countries, um, more than 200 indigenous nations, multiple states and provinces, as well as additional local municipalities. And so if you don't have a really strong visual representation of that, it's very easy to have voices be marginalized and to have folks left out of conversations and decision-making. And that has historically been what's happened with indigenous peoples in the Great Lakes. So it was a big, uh, it was a strong importance for me in my PhD work in capturing uh, what does transboundary water governance in the Great Lakes look like for indigenous nations to have a map that also spatially represented that. And I'm happy to say there are other scholars now working in this space, creating new maps, creating uh, digital mapping interfaces and portals that allow you to um, click in real time and move layers. And I think um, we're gonna see this space of uh, indigenous peoples, place names, languages being put back onto maps uh, grow in, in, in future years. And it also, again, brings us back to our conversation around projections and positionality. Um, I love the work of De Decolonial Atlas. So if you um, are looking to see um, more diverse maps, uh, maps that are from sort of the, the, the underdog of the, the underdogs of the world, um, Decolonial Atlas is a really great resource to go and explore. Um, they actually work with uh, Anishinaabe scholars to create uh, this version of the Great Lakes in uh, with all of the lakes named 
in uh, Anishinaabe Moan, which is um, the, the language of the Anishinaabe peoples or three fires peoples of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. And they also had a really interesting um, uh, project that changed, the pro that changed the projection and the orientation of the map so that um, north was not on top, but east was. And there is a cultural valuation within many uh, Anishinaabe, uh, well, largely within Anishinaabe cosmology um, that we, we orient ourselves to the east. So to have a map that orients itself to the north can feel um, very um, off-putting for some in indigenous uh, peoples, elders, knowledge holders. So they were exploring what could different orientations and projections look like. Um, and I hope that we can see more of that as we also have technology, technological advances, advancements that allow us to um, imagine the world differently or maybe imagine the world more accurately. So that leads us into how I wanna conclude our conversation and open it up for questions, which is just to recognize that you can play a role in creating GIS ecosystems for the benefit of all. Um, I will leave you with a quote by a wonderful uh, indigenous uh, scholar, Alex Niwagabo, who says, rooted in a love ethic, a decolonial practice may also keep future generations of indigenous people in mind and will aim to create spaces where they see themselves and not be afraid to be heard. No matter what trajectory you take in life, no matter what you decide to do in your academic careers, in your professional careers after you leave university, I hope that the conversation today will inspire you to keep future generations of indigenous young people in mind as you engage in GIS ecosystems and in future mapping and spatial representations so that they are not forgotten or left out. And this is a part of a larger community of methodological work happening right now, one in particular called Indigenous Data Sovereignty, which really recognizes that as indigenous peoples under international law the, and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we have rights, protected international rights, to, main, to, um, to manage our data and uh, the, the data on our people, our territories, our cultural heritage, our traditional knowledge, and our ways of life. And we're seeing more legislation and policy develop to acknowledge that. And when I say Indigenous data, it's data, information, knowledge in any format, including spatial data. Um, that can be about our resources and environments, about us as individuals, or about data about us as collectives, as nations and peoples. And that's probably maybe something that's a little bit different from the rest of the world. We don't have rights that just protect us as individuals, but we have rights that are protected in our collective, in our connection and, and um, in our connection to community as nations. And this wonderful work, if you're wanting to learn more about how to engage with data governance and geospatial uh, disciplines, you can go to US Indigenous Data Sovereignty um, or usindigenousdata.org. Um, this uh, lab is out of the University of Arizona. And a big takeaway from the work that I did um, and that, I, that you may have to engage with at some point in your careers is don't digitize. And this can be really any knowledge, but especially indigenous knowledge, don't digitize indigenous knowledge without consent. You know, we've for so long, we've had a legacy and a trauma associated with maps being created uh, where we were erased or maps being created not by us and not for us. And so we really have to get to a space of decoloniality where we empower the communities most impacted, indigenous or otherwise, to make maps for them by them that can really present their stories in a way that are effective and authentic. And so we need GIS scientists who care, which is to um, prioritize collective benefit, authority to control responsibility and ethics. This may be a bit high level, but I think it's important for me to share with you so you can get an understanding of how the discipline is advancing. Um, right now for indigenous peoples, we are saying that spatial data, all types of data needs to not only be, be fair, which is a acronym that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, but also care, collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. And I think a big takeaway about being geoscientists who care is that you should be concerned and constantly asking whether this endeavor that I am engaging in, in terms of geospatial work, could cause harm, or how can I minimize harm and maximize benefit? while ensuring that there are protections for communities that are particularly vulnerable or even historically have been particularly vulnerable to the harms of geography and the geospatial disciplines. So as we close out and turn it over for questions, 
we need to identify and confront the biases that are threaded throughout our data ecosystems. Whether we know it or not, we all have biases. And so we have to work to combat them and to prevent them in the future. We have to establish decolonized indigenous-led partnerships for mapping innovation and knowledge mobilization like what we did in the mid-Atlantic. We need more of that. Um, we need to empower indigenous peoples and have, and hopefully that will lead us to richer and more innovative um, data and GIS for everybody. So on that note, Chavutni, thank you. Um, you. There's my contact information there. I'll stop sharing my screen and open it up for questions. I know we're a little bit close on time, but I really appreciated being in conversation with you. So we do have a few minutes for questions from the classroom or people who are visiting us virtually. So if anyone has a question, feel free to. We have a question from class. Yeah, so we talk about decolonization a lot. Like, I don't know, it sounds like to me, it's like you want to like get rid of whatever they made and like put your like culture in so that it would be original. So the comment was decolonization sounds like taking away something and putting in another culture. Is that a fair paraphrase? Yeah, yeah, basically. yeah so maybe a, a little bit more elaboration on the idea of decolonization. I don't... Yeah, I think that's actually a really great comment. Um, and I would say it's not taking away something and putting something else in its place. It's putting something else in addition to. Um, and it's creating new pathways so that these multiple ways of knowing, these multiple experiences, forms of existence can live alongside each other. Um, I think that's the wonderful aspect of, you know, the emerging technologies within GIS. We, you know, with layers, with the way in which we're able to, sh you know, showcase data, we have probably a burgeoning opportunity, more so than we've ever had before, to allow for there to be greater coexistence of a plurality of understandings of space and spatial orientations than we ever have before. So I think right now for me, decolonization is more about seizing opportunity for innovation to communicate the most diverse stories possible. Oh, and we did have a question that came in on, Oh, there's a few questions. Thank you, everyone. Sorry, I'm missing the ones in the chat. Um, what sparked your interest in the topic that led you from a BA in anthropology to GIS? So really, um, I, I never, ha I, I haven't had formal GIS training. It's all been practitioner on the ground base. So I very much lean into folks that have uh, supported me in, in that journey. And I think kind of being a policy like a policy lens person in how to create more equitable GIS ecosystems as someone who actually uses them from a practitioner standpoint. Um, but even still, like you don't necessarily think of someone in anthropology, you know, later creating maps, later, you know, working in, in this space, leading, you know, PGIS methodologies in their work. Um, I think in large part, it was just the aspect of my work being centered in the environment, being centered in nature being you know, concentrated in trying to understand spatial representation, how we connect to place. Um, and another way of, of understanding that is sensing place or placemaking, uh, we call it often within the discipline of geography. And so um, I think it was just the happenstance or maybe the, the serendipitous nature of being in nature and needing to communicate that beauty through, a, through science communication and, and a visualization that was representative of the uh, diversity of actors and, and, and things going on all at the same time. Because I think sometimes, um, depending on who you're speaking to, environmental government governance can seem really easy, it can seem, oh, well, yeah, of course we should protect this or we should do that. But until you actually see the spatial representation of the multiplicity of actors and the diversity of viewpoints and how they may not always agree and actually are in conflict a lot of times, it can be, uh, it can be difficult to, to fully understand it. So that's, I, I think, how, how I came to fall into this work from not necessarily setting out in that direction. Um, 
The next question, is there additional education that you want to pursue with your current knowledge, perhaps specific courses? Um, so I would say now <laughs> my time is less uh, free than I would like it to be being a, a professor, but I will answer this question in terms of what I wished I would have uh, taken uh, maybe um, at, at your stage in your careers. And so I think I would have, I would have loved to have taken more GIS courses to uh, um, particularly um, have some experience in coding. Um, so if you can also, you know, get experience in different types of scripts and languages, um, R especially would be wonderful. I think now as an undergraduate, you might not, you might not know what that is, but you can look it up. It's very helpful in, in being able to um, shape uh, uh, maps, etc. cetera. Um, story mapping, I think too, like being, I think if you haven't had a class that has uh, allowed you to engage in story maps, Esri has a story map competition every year. Um, I actually think they have multiples for different streams. Um, so I would encourage you to check that out because it's a really great tool uh, that you can use outside of the classroom in your everyday lives as well as a good science communication tool for influencing policymakers, lawmakers, et cetera. So those would be some of the things I would, I would highlight. Um, and then the last question, there might be more live questions, but the last chat question was, how do tribes get recognized by the government? So there, there is a federal acknowledgement process that goes through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and it's very intensive. It can take a very long time. Um, so that is one way uh, that a tribe can uh, get acknowledged by the United States government. A tribe can also be judicially acknowledged. So a federal judge can acknowledge that they are in a government to government relationship with the United States, um, or there can be an act of Congress. So there can be a congressional recognition of a tribe as being a federally um, recognized tribe in a government to government relationship with the United States. Sometimes there, there may be a different avenue, but generally it's those three and more likely than uh, more often than not uh, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs federal acknowledgement process. Other questions? We have another question from the classroom. Okay. The question is about uh, how do you feel about sports teams having Native American names? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and I think there's probably actually some really cool maps that have uh, tried to, to chart that. Um, so, I, I mean, I have a personal opinion on that, which is um, there's no place for Native American mascot tree in any form of sport. Um, and it's not a form of honoring indigenous peoples, so it should uh, be removed. Um, I wish that the um, MLB had taken a more firm stance with the World Series and the way in which the Atlanta team continued to perpetuate racist stereotypes with the, uh, with the chop. Um, but they didn't. So I think we still have a long way to go. Um, and I'm hopeful that in a generation's time, um, if not sooner, that those mascots will no longer um, be a part of our American consciousness. Any other questions? I think we had one that came in the chat. I don't... Um, I'm currently in the ed program, but my day job is a high school Spanish teacher. I created a unit titled Who Was Here First, focusing on indigenous peoples of the Spanish speaking Americas. Are there any resources or experts you recommend aside from the ones you've mentioned? Oh yeah, that's, that's a really great question. I think it even might be a wonderful one to, um, to kind of close out our conversation. Um, but there is a new um, kind of virtual reality um, app that's being created for Washington, DC. So um, you can, uh, so, so I'm actually blanking on the name of it, but if you search indigenous peoples of Washington, DC app, it'll come out. It's being, I think, developed by George Washington University um, and uh, the indigenous studies program there. But it's basically a walking app and I'm seeing more of those, which I think are really, really great. Uh, there was one that's, uh, I think there's one for Toronto. I think there's one for uh, Montreal and now DC. I think we might see more of those to actually show um, the indigenous continued presence in urban spaces um, through these um, uh, geospatial apps. And so you, by downloading the app and as you sort of start the app and maybe you're walking around DC, it can either, the, the app can guide you to a location 
or if you're walking around, it will pop up if you pass a location that is um, of indigenous um, importance. And so I think that's a really good example. I'm trying to think for New Jersey, New York City, New York. I don't know of anything just yet in the tri-state area. I will say there is a tribal um, citizen from my nation um, named uh, Jeremy Dennis, who has a um, sort of online history mapping platform uh, called On This Site. Uh, I think it's onthissite.com. And that is also a wonderful resource. It's centered on Long Island, um, but it would be another resource that I would I would share. I'm hopeful maybe that will, maybe you guys will make something for, for Jersey, but um, nothing as of yet. Dr. Leonard, I just want to extend a thank you to you for taking the time to visit us virtually and share your knowledge with our students, faculty, and our community here. If you're ever in the area in the future, we would always welcome you um, to the campus uh, to, to visit with us. And we do want to continue to engage this topic into the future. So if there are any resources that you come across that you think we should consult, please send it to us, but we will also be actively engaging and in, in continuing to learn about this topic. So I wanna thank you again for visiting us. Well, thank you all so much. It really has been a pleasure to be in conversation with you today and I wish you all well on your GIS journeys. Take care.